Thank you so much, Zane. That was a great presentation. Way to start it off strong. On this earth right now, there are over 55 million people suffering from dementia. While we're hanging out and discussing emerging technology, there are some people who are suffering from dementia who can't have a conversation at all based on effects such as memory loss, confusion about time and place, and many more. And that sucks. Like, let's be honest, if I could change that in a second, of course I would. But that's not just something that you can do with the snap of your fingers or an abracadabra. It requires much more than that. Thankfully, there's an emerging technology which will come to market in the next 10 years that could help all of these people. And it came from the least likely of places. Algae. When most people see algae, they think about the thing that gets on your foot when you go to the beach and plays a critical part in the aquatic ecosystem. But it turns out that algae can have a great impact on other systems as well, such as the nervous system. And here's the reason why. This is a protein called channel rhodopsin, a type of opsin that's found in unicellular algae. Its main role within the algae is that it is used for photosynthesis. So when it is activated by the specific color of light, which in this case is blue light by the sun, then it opens up its channels and like signals to begin that process of photosynthesis. And initially, when scientists found this, they were just curious as to what it did, but then they realized that they could also use it in the brain for a technique called optogenetics. And the way that that works is that scientists were able to isolate the channel rhodopsin protein and genetically modify it into neurons in the brain through an injection. And then in addition, add a brain computer interface, which would send light to those neurons. And because the way that those opsins work is that when activated by light, they open up, then when light was shown on the specifically genetically modified proteins, then they would become active and the light was able to manipulate those neurons. And what was especially unique about this technique in comparison to other brain stimulation techniques is that unlike TMS or deep brain stimulation, this will only be have a reaction to the neurons which have been genetically modified. So it can be super precise and it can have an impact on one neuron or group of neurons without impacting other nearby neurons. So now that you understand what an opsin is in general, let's dive into that on a smaller level. Let's double click on that. So opsins are plasmids and plasmids are round circles of DNA that can function and perform functions such as replicating or duplicating without being attached to a larger body, pun intended, of DNA. And plasmids are unique because not only that, but they also have special features that can come with them, such as antibiotic resistance. And zooming in even more, plasmids are made of kinases. In this case, since we're looking at opsins, which are proteins, they're protein kinases. So as you can see here, all of the different kinases form a cycle and each one contributes to a different piece of the function of the plasmid. And then on a smaller level, kinases are made of amino acids. And on the smallest level, amino acids are made of nucleotides and base pairs, um, the building blocks of all life which are thymine, adenine, cytosine, and guanine. Now that we understand what opsins are, we're gonna look into a different opsin called carmine. And the reason why is because when optogenetics was initially discovered, it was discovered because of channel rhodopsin. And so as someone who has looked into optogenetics for a little while now and done some projects and exploring in it, you basically see channel rhodopsin all of the time. That's the main one, it's the most popular. And I was getting a little bored, so I was curious to learn about a different type of opsin. And the one that I chose was carmine. So carmine, instead of being activated by blue light, is activated by red light. And its purpose is that it has excitatory properties. So the two different types of opsins are those which are excitatory and can increase activation of neurons, and then inhibitory, which decrease activation of neurons. So carmine is excitatory, and what makes it special and why people would choose to use carmine over other types of excitatory opsins is that it has very good temporal resolution and it doesn't require a lot of light to be activated. 
So that's why it's preferable. And it's largely used in the VTA and the hippocampus, which are used for cognition and memory respectively. And those are parts of the brain that are farther down and back. So once I realized that I wanted to look into carmine and I figured out what it was, that's when it was time to actually do some technical stuff. So I went to Benchling, which is a cloud-based informatics software that has a lot of great use cases for biology and specifically molecular biology. And what you're looking at right here is a vector of a carmine opsin. It's a plasmid. So that big circle is a plasmid. The name is on top. And as you can see, this is a specific subtype of carmine opsin. And the only thing that makes it required to be a carmine opsin is that it expresses the carmine kinase. But these other kinases over here, they can vary. And so there's different subtypes. This is the one that I was looking at. And then each of these differently colored shapes inside of that circle that you can see, those are the protein kinases. Then on the left, you can see the different base pairs sorted by kinase in the form of those nucleotides. So here is a video demonstration of what I did. Initially, I just started off by looking at one type of carmine, and then I explored a little bit, and you'll see what I mean there. So here is a carmine kinase. You can see that those are the base pairs, and the letters underneath them are amino acids. So the first thing I did was I translated those base pairs into amino acids, and every three base pairs forms an amino acid. And then on the side here are some biochemical properties. So up at the top, you can see some different properties such as molecular weight. Then scrolling down is the frequency of each different type of amino acid in the plasmid. And there's 20 types of amino acids in comparison to only four different types of nucleotides. And then down here at the bottom is the charge of those based on their acidic properties. And then after I had figured that out for just one type, I was looking to compare a few different types. So I found this different carmine kinase or carmine plasmid. And then there's the one I was initially looking at. And over here, you can see that they line up exactly. I'm going to scroll through in the video in a sec. And you can see that they have the exact same number of every single type of plasmid and the exact same number of those nucleotides, which is 927. So once I looked to the different kinases, you can see that this one starts with ATGG, but the other one starts with a different set of those nucleotides because it starts with AGAC. And so I was curious, well, what's the difference then? What is the significance of the fact that they have the exact same number of every nucleotide and they have the same quantity of each type of nucleotide, but in a totally different order? What does that actually mean? So what I realized was that the reason is because even though they're both carmine, they have that in common, they're both excitatory and are activated by red light and their general properties are similar. They have different use cases and functions within that bigger umbrella of carmine. So an example that I thought of that would be a helpful analogy was that funeral has the exact same letters in it as the words real fun, but those are complete opposites. So even if they use the same letters, those two things mean totally different stuff and you use them in totally different scenarios. So that's comparable to the two different sets of nucleotides, which have the same letters, but in a totally different order. So let's come back to that initial hook of Alzheimer's. What is the significance here? What is carmine doing for Alzheimer's? As I had mentioned before, carmine is largely used for functions in the VTA and the hippocampus, which are for memory and cognition, and it's an excitatory opsin. So the reason why that's so helpful for Alzheimer's and other forms of dementia is because Alzheimer's is a neurodegenerative condition. And what that means is that over time, the abilities of neurons in those areas that are used for memory, their abilities degenerate. So they get worse, some neurons stop working at all, or they just don't work in the way that they used to, not as well. So by applying carmine to those areas and activating it with light at given times, you can manipulate those neurons to stay active and force them to stay active. And through that, 
you can keep a person's memory and the hippocampus and VTA used for that memory and cognition up. And by doing that, then you can combat the adverse effects of Alzheimer's and other forms of dementia, which is crazy. That could have a huge impact. Remember those 55 million people I was talking about before? Optogenetics could be the future for all of them. It might still be in mice trials and a very much emerging technology as it will take around 10 years to develop. But just this year, optogenetics was able to help a blind man see for the first time. That's crazy. So we know this is gonna work and it's insane. All that we need is a little bit more time, but optogenetics and opsins such as carmine could be the future for people with neurodegenerative conditions and other types as well. Thank you. Cool, thanks Reyna. Let's get some Zoom reactions in. If you got feedback for Reyna, add it in the chat. Any feedback on our presentations, ideas, if you have questions you have that weren't answered, throw it in the chat. That's a gift that Reyna can, can open up and look at post, post presenting. One thing I really liked Reyna was how you prepped for this presentation. You're only one of two people who actually got feedback. You got for one-on-one, -on -one, like, hey, this is what I'm working on for apply, like give feedback here. Here's my storyboard, here's what that looks like. And I can see the iteration just based off of that feedback. So I wanted to call that out because that's something that no one else here can see, but I really like that because when prepping for something, it doesn't make sense to just like, this is your first time presenting. It's like in the process, get feedback, get other perspective, that makes it better. And then also the, I actually liked how you ended your presentations. That was one of the questions I was gonna ask you was what's the difference between what's been shown in research and what's possible today? So I like that that was the way that you ended because that was actually one of the questions I had. So in terms of two questions, can you talk a little bit more, what does Benchling do and why did you decide to use Benchling for your apply? Yeah, um, so Benchling is a software that's mainly used for cloud or biological computing. And so some different functions that it has, I was exploring around when I first saw it. And besides what I was doing, you can look at different sequences of DNA, you can edit them, there are some CRISPR features. So if you're into gene editing, um, that would be super good resource for you. Um, then you can also, like you saw before, you can translate different sequences into amino acids, break them down into nucleotides, or do different stuff like that. And so it's mainly intended for people in biological research. And the reason why I chose to use Benchling is because I actually did explore some other similar platforms that offered vectors and of those same carmine kinases or different variations of carmine kinases that would have worked just the same for the project but i found that i found that benchling was preferable because it offered a lot more information surrounding those biochemical properties that i was showing before and like on the bottom you weren't able to see during the presentation but if you clicked on a specific thing then it would be able to tell you like this is like where your mouse is inserted in comparison to like the entirety of the code and like this is the percentage of xyz so i thought that it had a lot more data and detail throughout the process and that's why i chose benchling as opposed to a different piece of software got it and next question i have is more around the last thing that you mentioned can you tell us a little bit more how did it work how did they use optogenetics to help a blind man see what was that process like so you talked you walked through us different pathways for opsin. You talked about how to identify and what that looks like. What was that process? And yeah, can you just talk a little bit more for how that worked in the example you shared? Yeah, so I believe that the man that it was used on, he had lost his sight at a very young age. Um, so he initially had functioning eyes, but then an accident of some sort had occurred and he lost his sight because of that. And so, as you know, or as you may know, the brain is right near the eyes and they have certain connections to each other. And so I believe that, I, I believe that uh, what happened, sorry, um, I think that what happened there was that they brought the man into the facilities and they obviously like did some testing to collect some data about um, what parts of his eyes were not working. And then the part of the brain, which is used to interpret things that you see like visually was modified so that it could be excited with excitation of neurons. 
And then because of that, the man was actually able to see. Um, and I, I would need to look in, more into the details. I'm happy to send you an article or put it in the general Slack later, but I believe that it was in areas that are used for visual processing and they were able to excite those areas. Yeah, they're 